Well, this morning we're in a part of the Bible that is both very familiar to us, I imagine, but somehow at the same time deeply strange to us. The Beatitudes. I suspect that all of us, on one hand, find them rather inspirational, right? Wouldn't it be wonderful for us to be the inheritors of the earth? For us to be the children of God and His kingdom come? That's inspiring. And on the other hand, with the, we find them to be also aspirational. We're given ideals of what it means to be a kingdom people. In the words of Jesus, to be the humble poor, the pursuers of justice, and committed peacemakers. These nine little statements over these verses have turned empires upside down. They've confronted wickedness have worked together to abolish evils. They've ushered in days of prosperity and peace for many. However, at the same time, these same nine little statements have also caused so much anxiety in Christians as well. It's made us to feel as if these standards of life are impossible to live up to in this passing age. After all, look at it, who it is that Jesus blesses in this list. Not the rich, not the mighty, not the successful, not the first, not the esteemed, and not even the very religious. No, paradoxically, Jesus blesses those who are poor and who mourn. Jesus blesses those who are hungry and humble, who are merciful and pure, and those, this is the hardest of all for us to understand. Those who are able to rejoice even in their suffering and slandering and their persecution. Now, let's be real with ourselves, folks. There are many days that we wake up and feel that none of these things are true about us. We are only tired and grouchy. We can be described as selfish and angry bitter and vengeful, frightened and faithless. We don't feel like we live into the Beatitudes at all. So while on the one hand, we can see their inherent beauty, the inherent beauty of the Beatitudes, or as Pastor Kent Hughes quipped, that some call them the beautiful attitudes. While we can see that, simultaneously they really get under our skin, don't they? The Beatitudes make us question our devotion to God and if we even really love our neighbor like He calls us to. So in our brief survey of the Beatitudes, which, by the way, we could take each one of these lines over the next several months and and contemplate them alongside other Scriptures for weeks on end, but we're going to be going just through them all in one fell swoop today. We might be asking this big question. When we read the Beatitudes and we see how they're inspirational and yet aspirational, where do we find the line between how these are prescriptive, meaning that uh, they are describing what we can and should be? How are they prescriptive of what we can and should be? And where's the line between that and how they are descriptive, meaning of describing what we already are? In other words, how do we understand these as commands that we're supposed to live out or descriptors of who we actually are already? What are the Beatitudes trying to tell us? What do they communicate to us disciples who have have huddled up along with Jesus' first 12 disciples in the crowds that are sitting uh, under His teaching on the mountain trying to understand what it means to be a Christian? Well, before we think through the specifics of these questions, and before we get into the nitty-gritty of talking about these nine Beatitudes, which, by the way, comes from the Latin word for blessing or bless, Beatitude, let's remember some of the overarching themes that we have set out to find in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, first and foremost, last week, we underscored this idea. And this is something that we have to keep ever before our eyes if we're to understand this well and properly at all. That every aspect of the sermon is perfectly displayed 
and the life and the heart and the deeds of Jesus. And this is especially true of the Beatitudes. Jesus fully embodies everything we see in these statements. They're not only ideals for Him, they're His actuality. Jesus is the one who's poor in spirit. He's the one who mourns for the curse of sin and its effects in our lives. He's the one who humbles Himself to this lowly position. He is the one who hungers for justice and righteousness. He was the one who was merciful to those that did not deserve mercy. He was pure in heart before His Father. He was a peacemaker between God and man. And because of all of that, we know that Jesus was slandered, reviled, and persecuted unto death. As Christians, when we think about the Beatitudes then, we first must not think about them for ourselves, but we must think rather about Him. That's our first point. That these are all about Jesus. They teach us who He is. They help us to see His beauty. They help us to understand as His followers why it is we're so grateful to follow Him. But secondly, how do these things that Jesus talks about here and elsewhere in the sermon, how are they meant to be uh, an indicator to us of how human beings can flourish? Or to say it another way, how is it that understanding the Beatitudes can help us experience the shalom, great old Hebrew word, the shalom of God? That is the peace of His presence. Life as it always should have been for humanity. And perfect virtue in God's wisdom. See, the Beatitudes are the beginning of the path of human flourishing. If you want to know what the good life looks like, you look at the Beatitudes. Real happiness. Beyond just sort of emotional feeling, but true, deep, lasting happiness, blessedness, and even humanness. You want to know what it looks like to be a human in God's design and by, by God's decree? You look at those who live out the life of the Beatitudes. This is the beginning of wisdom. And that's the beginning of the fear of the Lord. And that's the beginning of life in Him. The Beatitudes. When we look at the Beatitudes, we not only see how they're perfectly encapsulated in the life of Jesus, but how they describe a meaningful, beautiful, flourishing life for us. Or as theologian Jonathan Pennington says, all such flourishing statements we read here, or blessings, or Beatitudes as we call them, they cast a vision for life that includes an implicit, that is an implied invitation. Beatitudes are description and commendations of what the good life is. See, so often in our culture, we're asking, what, what, does, it mean to be a, what does it mean to live a good life? What does it mean to do something meaningful in this world? And this is Jesus answering that statement for us definitively. As a prophet and sage, Jesus is offering and inviting His hearers into the way of being in the world that will result in their true and full flourishing not only now in this life when things are not as they should be, but in the age to come as well. The beautiful truth about this means that in God's divine authority, while Jesus is more than a philosopher of happiness, in other words, He's not a self-help guru, Jesus is more than a philosopher of happiness. At the same time, He's not less than that. If we follow Jesus, we will see and understand what true God-given happiness is supposed to look like. The fact of the matter is, in the story of Scripture, although there are many ups and downs, we can see that God is truly for our good as human beings. God is pro-human. He is invested in our joy and our delight. And Jesus shows Himself to follow in the ancient tradition 
of other Jewish sages who offer practical wisdom for living life in this world according to God's rule and reign. The Beatitudes are a reality for life in this moment. They are things that can be lived out today. They are not impossible ideals for the present and things that can only be true in the future. No, in Jesus, they are realities for now. As 20th century Belgian theologian, I believe I'm pronouncing his name correctly here, Servius Pinkers says, the Beatitudes are Jesus' answer to the question about happiness. And an answer is given to us in the form of a series of promises and challenges. I like the way he says that. With all of our pressing questions in this life, so often we're wondering how can we live life uh, the most joyfully, the most meaningfully. Jesus gives us a resoundingly clear answer here. But notice this. He not only gives it to us as promises, but also as challenges. Because while the promises of the Beatitudes are lovely, that heaven and earth will be ours, that comfort and satisfaction belong to us, that we will receive mercy, that we will see God, etc. The way into this life, the way to this is through the difficulty of poverty and sorrow. Of being merciful to the merciless. Of being a peacekeeper for those that have no peace in and of themselves. It means living a life of purity and getting nothing but persecution in return. And so these are promises to us. God gives us these beautiful realities. But the way to those beautiful realities is a tough, arduous, difficult road. Nothing about these statements is what the world really wants. So, when the world thinks of, you know, blessed are the meek, to quote the King James, for they'll inherit the world, they love the idea of inheriting the world. But they don't give one fig about ever being meek. <laughs> But Jesus says, to get to this point, this is the reality of who you will be. And so the world rejects these Beatitudes. The world wants to get to this kind of glory by their own means. And so these Beatitudes are not what the world teaches. They say, blessed are the strong, for they can oppose and oppress the weak. Blessed are the proud who can exalt themselves and be worshipped by others, by their peers. Blessed are the rich who can buy whatever or whoever they want. Blessed are the young, the talented, the brilliant, the beautiful, for they are more important than anyone else. These are the world's beatitudes. But as Christian philosopher Dallas Willard once wrote, this list that we get here from Jesus is a God-based inversion of what the world wants. We see God working out a Gospel for a silly and perishing world here. Or as the Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, this kind of weakness from the world's perspective is actually the strength of God. This kind of foolishness, again, according to the world, is the wisdom of God. So make no mistake, Christian, these blessings that we hope for are ours, but they only come to us from the Lord our God. They're nothing the world can give us. They're nothing that any human authority or culture or financial system or educational status can give us. These blessings come exclusively from the Lord our God. And who is He? I love how the Lutheran pastor Robert Jensen used to answer this question. Who is God? Well, He is none other than the One who raised Jesus from the dead, having first raised Israel out of Egypt. If you want to know who God is, that is how you define Him. He's the One who raises Jesus from the dead and the One who first raised Israel out of slavery. 
the God of the Old Testament and the New, is the fulfiller of these blessings for His people. He and He alone. He's the same God that we read about just a few weeks ago in Isaiah 61 on the first Sunday of the New Year. He's the one that frees the captives, that heals the sick, that comforts the mourners, that announces His favor to fallen yet redeemed sinners. And scholars believe that this passage, Isaiah 61, is something Jesus has explicitly in mind as He's crafting out His blessing statements. There's too many words, too many ideas, and similar for Him not to have this in His mind. In fact, when Jesus first gets His ministry started, one of the first sermon, if not the first sermon He preaches, is from Isaiah 61. And saying all these good things, the, the captives shall go free, the, the mourners shall be comforted, the, the sick shall be healed, that's fulfilled in Me. So Jesus, in, in beginning His own ministry, has this as the reality of what's going to happen to human beings. But just like with that passage in Isaiah 61, these Beatitudes reflect both a now reality, things that are true now, but a yet in the future quality. In other words, there is a blessing to be had in the here and the now and a life lived out this way. If we live out our lives this way, this day and this coming week will have its own set of blessings in its difficulty. However, these blessings will only fully come to fruition in the day of Jesus Christ. When His kingdom, which is partially here now, and His presence and in His church will come into its full glory in this world. So the Beatitudes offer us blessing for now, but a blessing that will be shown in full when He comes to set all things right. And just like those, who in Isaiah 61, again, a passage that Jesus is very obviously linking to. These blessings from God are a one-way gift to His people who cannot help themselves. They're not something that, in other words, we work hard to earn these things. God gives these things to people like us who are physically, politically, spiritually, and socially helpless. God gives independently these blessings and these graces to us independently of our merit, or rather our demerit. In other words, the Beatitudes are not given by Jesus as a checklist for moral progress. The Beatitudes are not things that we accomplish if we just put all of our human willpower into it. He does not tell us, as Scott McKnight says, to go out and become poor or to start mourning or to get ourselves persecuted. Jesus doesn't say, go do these things. Rather, Jesus blesses people who already are those things. The Beatitudes reveal that Jesus' ministry, as can be seen clearly in Jesus' inaugural sermon, again, in Luke 4, where He reads deeply in Isaiah 61. Jesus focuses on the down and outs. He's casting a vision so that His audience will come to know things are not what they think they are. Instead, God sees all. And God knows those who are living properly regardless of their circumstances and conditions. So the Beatitudes force the listener to expand what they, uh, uh, what they think of as blessed. See, we think of, we look around this world, or we hear people talk like this. Oh, they have a nice house, a nice car, a good job, a uh, good family, plenty in the bank, and they're blessed. But Jesus expands our notion of what blessing is. Blessed are those that don't have anything. Blessed are those who care about my glory and the good of others. Those are the ones who are truly rich. So He expands 
what blessing is, but he also contracts what blessing is. In other words, the world thinks through power and force and, and, and through influence that they can usher in blessing. But those will find out, aside from the mercy and grace of Jesus, that everything they've hoarded and gathered to themselves this whole life is just fuel for the fire. It's chaff that will blow away. And it won't save them or preserve them one iota. Expressed another way, Stanley Hauerwas reflected on some of these things while he was uh, uh, preaching a sermon for his father's funeral. He said this, he said, too often these characteristics of the Beatitudes are turned into ideals we must strive to attain. As ideals, we tend to turn them into formulas for power. In other words, schemes to get control rather than descriptions of the kind of people characteristic of the new age brought about only by Christ. Thus, Jesus does not tell us that we should try to be poor in spirit or that we should try to be meek or peacemakers. He simply says that many who are called into the kingdom will find themselves so already. Friends, this is not checklist Christianity. It's something infinitely better than that. It's Gospel. It's good news. It's God's goodness through Jesus Christ made manifest in those who follow Him. In other words, before we even realize what's going on in our life, the, through Jesus, these things start to develop in us. See, we don't, re, we don't set out to be mourners for the, the devastation of sin. When we worship Jesus and we follow Him, we mourn the sad things in this world. And when we follow after Him and we see what He says is right, how He says to, 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 to lift up the lowly, then we find ourselves as people that are hungering and thirsting after justice and righteousness. It's not that we strive to do those things so we'll get His approval. No, because we follow and love Him, we find He's already working out those things in us. So, very quickly, how do we understand these Beatitudes in summary? Well, many have tried to discern a pattern to Jesus' blessing. Why does He put them in this order? Why does He say it this way? And, and there's really not a discernible um, pattern that He's working from. But, I think one of the simplest and most effective ways to read these Beatitudes is to see them in three major clusters of ideas that relate together. And they're not just you know, you can, anybody, I mean, you can find patterns all over the Bible that aren't really supposed to be there if you look hard enough. <laughs> There's so much in there that you can make up your own things. But I think these patterns are and themes are evident uh, because they appear elsewhere in Jesus' teaching, especially in the Gospel of Matthew. And so I think there's three major themes that Jesus talks about here that we can find elsewhere in His teaching. And so, the question is, who is blessed? First, Jesus says, the humble and the poor. These are in verses 3, 4, and 5. He says, these are the poor in spirit. These are the mourners. These are the humble. The poor in spirit, meaning those who are destitute not only physically, but spiritually. Now, when Luke gives his version of the Beatitudes, it's a much more truncated list, he just calls them the poor. He focuses on the, the, the physical and financial aspect of that, but Matthew expands the idea out a little more. Those that Jesus says are blessed are not only poor physically in their resources, but they're poor spiritually. In other words, those that are not self-sufficient in the material of this world and those who are not self-sufficient in their relationship with God. 
In other words, the poor in spirit mean those that depend on God for everything. For the food they eat and for their relationship with Him. They bring nothing to the table, so to speak. They're totally dependent on God. They're poor. You know what God says of those people? He'll give them His glory and His home to share. This is how He starts the Beatitudes. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those that don't have anything physically or spiritually because I am going to give them all of what is mine. What grace. What generosity. And He goes on. The mourners. What are they mourning? Those that are mourning and grieving sins, power, and guilt. Those that are who love God and are with Him and weep as the Old Testament prophets do that Jesus mentions at the end of this passage. That weep over idolatry of worship of false God. That weep over injustice. How we unfairly and cruelly treat one another. God will comfort them and satisfy their sorrow. And not only those who mourn, but those who are meek. Or as it's rendered here, those who are humble. In other words, those that don't strive for worldly power or significance or wealth, but only glory in God and only look for the welfare of others. Tasks that make them powerless. To be humble means that you exalt God and look out for the sake of others before you look out for yourself. That that's the hierarchy of importance. Worshiping God, looking out for God's other creations. And divesting yourself of any of your self-concern. And for those, Jesus says, they will inherit all the beauty and majesty of earth, of this creation. Those who are poor, those who mourn, those who are humble, nothing that the United States of America is interested in, nobody that we elevate in this country, they will flourish. They'll receive heaven and earth and all of God's love and presence. So who is blessed? Those who are humble and poor. That's the first set. What about who else? Who else is blessed? Second, those who pursue righteousness. This is in verses 6, 7, and 8. Jesus says those who hunger for justice, yet, yet who are merciful, and yet are also pure in heart. So who are blessed? It's the ones that, uh, that live into these things. In other words, the ones who not only love God with all their, with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, but act accordingly to that love for others' sake. To put it in Old Testament terms, the people that Jesus is describing here are starved. They hunger. They thirst. They are needing to see the widow and the orphan defended. Who advocate for the sick and the immigrants. Who are generous with the poor and the unloved. Go to the beginning of Isaiah, the great, some people call this the fifth gospel in the Old Testament. Go to the beginning of Isaiah, and they have beautiful worship services, and their priests are all dressed nice, and they get a great offering, and the choirs all sound beautiful, but they don't love anybody but themselves. They don't care if there's Children without parents on the street begging. They don't care if there's elderly that are sick and dying locked away unloved. They don't care if there is immigrants and strangers in this land trying to find peace and a new life uh, when it's so easy to put those people down. They, they don't care about the sick that are in the hospitals and are dying alone and and God says to people like that who worship Him in, in lip service alone, He says, I hate all your sacrifice and your worship. Until you are the kind of person that actually truly loves Me and shows that by loving the people that I love, I am not interested in your church service. 
That's the kind of people that Jesus is calling us to be. People who are, 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 our souls are filled, to quote Amos 5.24, when justice flows down like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. In other words, when people in this world that are disadvantaged and hurting and sorrowful are lifted up by others that can help them. When nobody is uh, lower class and, 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 and treated like they're less than, but are pulled up and elevated and seen as equal brothers and sisters in God's ordering of things. Jesus says, those people will be blessed. And yet, although we are called to be a people that demand justice in an unjust world, Jesus said, blessed also are the ones that are merciful still. I think a lot of self-righteousness happens around the justice talk. We can see when people or groups of people in this world or, or, or communities or, this, or wherever, our schools or neighborhoods or our state or city or whatever, we can see when groups of people are being treated unfairly. And that's not right. And it's a good Christian thing to do to love and advocate for those people. But so many people take that opportunity to pursue the cause of of just treatment as a way to say, I'm so much better than you because I care about these things. Well, those people that care about justice in that sense obviously don't care about mercy either. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger not only for justice and righteousness, but for mercy as well, because they will receive mercy. See, Christians, we know that there's a lot of things in our society, in our world, that are wrong. And there's a lot of people that are treated wrongly. And it's good for us to speak up for them. But if we don't also be merciful people that know our own sins and our own need for a Savior and show mercy to others who are sinful and need a Savior, well, let's not forget what the brother of our Lord Jesus tells us in his letter, James chapter 2, verse 13. He said, Judgment is without mercy to the one who has not shown mercy. In other words, if you're not merciful, you will receive all the judgment you want to deal out. Mercy triumphs over judgment, he says. There are many things in this world to be righteously angry about and opposed to. But in the end, Christians are not supposed to be people of justice alone, but also of mercy. Mercy even towards our enemies because Christ was merciful to His enemies who were us. And finally, He speaks of the pure in heart. Blessed is the pure in heart. I think this is referring to those that are uh, find balance and, and, and the need for justice and the need for mercy, those whose thoughts match their deeds, those that can approach God purely because they're living out these things with equal fervor, justice, and mercy. And for those, the Lord says, they will see God. These people flourish too, that hunger for justice, that desire mercy, and live pure in heart before God. So that's the second group that is blessed. First, it's those that are poor and humble. Second, it's those that think of justice and mercy. And third and finally, it's for those who create peace. This is verses 9 through 12. The peacemakers and the persecuted. Now, my goodness, we live in such a time where, where peacemakers are all too few. Peacemakers are the kind of people that have been reconciled to God through Jesus and who spend their life in turn trying to bring God's reconciliation, the good news of the Gospel, to others so that they may be reconciled as well. In other words, 
True peacemakers are not people that spend all their time online or wherever else arguing and debating and in fighting and insisting. That's very popular in our day and age. To fight and debate and argue. It's all over our news channels. It's all over social media. It is in insisting on my way or the highway. That's what the world says is blessed. To argue. To be right. To hold it over. To lord it over others. But Jesus said, blessed is the peacemaker that seeks peace between man and man, but especially between man and God. Now this is more than passively being nice. Not getting our hands dirty in all the drama. But it's stepping in actively to diffuse and reunite. See, people that live, uh, Christians that live out lives of, uh, that are concerned for justice and mercy will naturally, inherently be peacekeepers. Because we'll want to see, uh, we'll want to see people become reconciled, reunited. That's, that's our heart's content. And it calls us to bear witness to a kingdom that unlike the world, is not built on the bloodshed of our foes, but on the bloodshed of the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. That's the the only place where we're going to want to see violence. When God inflicted violence upon God so that we might be saved. We're not going to be a people that are constantly seeking to, to put one over on those that we don't. And this last one is so especially difficult that Jesus said, not only at the beginning He said, blessed is this, but again, He elaborates and says, these people are blessed. So He doubles down. He says it twice. All of this kind of living that we've discussed so far, being righteous and just and merciful and peaceful, if you live this kind of life truly and consistently and authentically, well, persecution is coming for you. These sound ideal, don't they? Of course we care about justice. Of course we care about mercy. Of course we care about righteousness. Of course we care about peace. But when you live those out, the world will come at you hard. While you stand up for others in the name of Jesus, while you try to make peace in this hateful world, you will then become the target of verbal harassment and all manner of injustice. Jesus even tells these people that are listening to Him. He warns them. It's because of Me you'll experience this. Because this is My way, not the world's way. And if you live out My way, the world is going to hate that. It undermines their power. Because you follow Me and not sin. Because you choose God's wisdom, not the world's. Because you seek My virtue, not your own vice you will be persecuted and slandered and reviled. But, Jesus says twice, you are blessed. You are blessed. This is the hardest one of all. Because in the other ones, we can say, well, we do these difficult things. We live out these difficult things, but at least we're rewarded. But now, this one is putting some heat to us. People are going to be against you. Some people are not only going to want to destroy your reputation, they're going to want to destroy your life. We need the courage that Jesus gives us to tell us that we are blessed. And despite their cruelty, despite their unfairness, if we live into this with Jesus, we will flourish. Now Christians, do not waste your time joining the rank and file of politicians and pundits that want to try to play off your worst impulses and fears. That is such a strong pull for evangelicals in this country. There are those that try to make you think that being a Christian in this country entitles you to a me-first attitude. That because you don't get respect like you used to in the 50s, Well, it's time to crack some skulls now. They get on their news programs every night and tell you that garbage. You should show those pagans who's boss. You should be cruel and mean-spirited in your words and actions. 
It's Christ first in this nation. Folks, I'm going to be as clear as I can be with you. That is the attitude of the world and the attitude of its father, the devil. So many Christians buy into, well, this is a Christian nation and we're going to support Christian nationalism. And we're, we're going to make it all about us. We're going to return and be a Christian nation. And they do it through violence and hate and destruction and opposition. They refuse the mantle of persecution. And in doing so, they refuse the Christ they claim to love. Jesus came to give up His life for His enemies. Not to put his enemies down so, so that we'll put prayers back in school. Prayer in school is important. But guess what? You can pray in school whether it's legislated by the state or not. I don't want to hear anybody talk about prayer in schools till they get serious about praying with their church. I don't want to hear all this uh, oh, oh, persecution. They, they don't like us. Of course they don't like you. Most of the time, they don't like you because you're mean as the devil. And you say it's in Jesus' name. I see this online all the time. People say hurtful, insulting, mean-spirited things, and then their little profile online says, I love Jesus. Trying to share the Gospel with all. That's a Fox News and CNN way of living. That's Beatitudes according to Twitter and Facebook. But that is not the way of Jesus Christ. Blessed are you who rejoice when you get the privilege to suffer for Jesus who suffered for you. What a, what a backhand to the Son of God when He gave up everything for you and you get one minor inconvenience and you want to complain about Christian persecution in this nation. The kingdom of heaven is yours! Not through standing up for your rights, but because God has rewarded it for you because of what Jesus has done on your behalf when you were a rotten hypocrite and scoundrel, and even when you are today. Listen, I love you all, but every face I see in this congregation is a hypocrite! The kingdom of heaven is still yours. God's reward of life and joy and vindica vindication and resurrection are yours. Why? Because you're so good? No, but because God is so good for you. Folks, don't rob yourself of the blessing of the Beatitudes. Follow Jesus through shadow and through the strife, through poverty and through the pain, through humiliation and through the horror. Look to Jesus through it all. And when you work hard for peace, and when you serve the lowly, and when you relinquish your rights and your power and your wealth, you will find a life more abundant and free than you could have ever imagine than anything the world could flash before your eyes in temptation. Because you, even through your sins and struggles, your flaws and failures, will be following Jesus who has lived out these Beatitudes perfectly for and before you. Are the Beatitudes something you have to achieve? Will God love you more? Heavens no. While you were His enemy, Christ loved and died for you. He has lived this out for you already! It's done! And now because He loves you so much, He invites you into the joy and blessing of His own life. You get to live into His flourishing and live out these things where you can find blessing upon blessing and grace upon grace grace. The work of the Beatitudes is done. They are accomplished. You're not called to live into them so that you can actualize them. They've been actualized. You're called to live into them now to experience the same blessing of 
being with God Almighty. The late Presbyterian pastor and preacher, Eugene Peterson, summarized it this way, Scripture does not present us with a moral code and tell us, live up to this. Nor does the Scripture set out a system of doctrine and say, think like this and you will live. In other words, it is not works righteousness and it is not belief righteousness. Rather, the biblical way to think about these things is to tell the story of Jesus. And in the telling, invite others, live into this. This is what it looks like to be human in the God-made world and the God-ruled world. And Jesus has gone before you in all of it. We are not redeemed by what we do. And believe it or not, Protestants, we are not redeemed by our doctrine. We are redeemed by Jesus. Good doctrine and good works follow as we follow Him. But He's the one that redeems us. Not us through our beliefs or our actions. And Christ has already lived this out fully and for your blessing. And so, live into this church. You're free. The Beatitudes are not a weight around your neck. They're an invitation to enjoy life as Jesus has lived it out for you. Let's pray. Father, this is Your world. And Christ has overcome it for us. So by Your Spirit, empower us to live into these blessings so that we may flourish and may invite others into the flourishing that comes through You. And Lord, as we depart in just a moment to enjoy a meal and some games together, we give You thanks for our fellowship and for our food. It's a precious gift for our precious church family. It's in Jesus' name that I ask and pray for all these things. Amen.